my eighth grade. Uh, we're going to continue reading our book, uh, Farewell to Manzanar Today by Jean Wakasuki Houston and James D. Houston. We are up to chapter 13. Uh, so we do have some questions that go along with that today. So let me quickly share my screen so that you can follow along with me on those questions. And we see here for chapter 13, um, there are actually six questions. I'll show you the sixth one in a minute. Chapter 13, question one, we see in her second year at the internment camp, school opens. Why is this a good thing for Jean and for the entire community? So keep in mind that that whole first year that she was in the internment camp, there was no school. Uh, kind of like right now, I mean, although we're still continuing to learn, there was no school. How does that affect your daily life and your daily schedule that you are not going to go learn? And maybe we can apply that to this question here. We'll see that in just a minute. Question two, describe Jean's fourth grade teacher. Why would a woman like this agree to come work with these prisoners in the middle of the desert? Three, explain how Iso and Lewis were like Romeo and Juliet. Um, so we have not read Romeo and Juliet yet. That is a Shakespeare play. I'm sure you know quite a bit about it. It's one of the most alluded to um, plays, romance tragedies out there. So Romeo and Juliet, most of you I'm sure know, is a love story. What you may not know is that these two people were not supposed to be together. Their families were in a feud. They did not get along. So the fact that these two young people were in love, the, the families would have never, ever approved. Um, so they kind of went behind their families' backs. And um, unfortunately, there were some, some things that happened along the way that although they were uh, married and sort of together, they also ended up um, dying. Uh, one of them, well, I don't want to tell too much because you might read it next year, but there we go. It ends up being a tragedy. It does not work out in the best, the best for the two of them. So how would that be similar necessarily to question three? Question four, what did Jean find so appealing about baton twirling? Not a, um, something we see too much today, so unless maybe um, you watch uh, you know, the, some of the bands, the marching bands that have people, um, the color guard that will perform and they twirl different um, flags and uh, sometimes they look like guns, um, but baton twirling falls into that category as well. Um, and especially during this time period, baton twirling was very popular. Um, so what is it that she finds to be appealing about that? Why does it draw her in? What is she interested in? Question five, in what way does the aging ballet dancer provide a warning for Jean and the other residents of Manzanar? In what way does she provide a warning for modern readers too? So first answer it based on the book, and then second, we are those modern readers. What warning can we take from this ballet dancer who is getting on in years? And one last question for chapter 13, question six, why didn't Papa allow Jean to be baptized as a Catholic? So I do have my book at home, and this may be one of the last lessons where I choose to share it on the screen. Um, I would really like you to start following along with me as I get information back from you. It looks like everybody has their book, um, and I really would like to see that you are, are reading from the book. Uh, I think I will put the question, or not the questions, the pages up on the screen for today, and then I'm going to try to get a little feedback to see how many of you are, are using that or if you're just looking at, at your book. Once again, um, if you are comfortable just reading it on your own and answering the questions, you certainly are welcome to do that. You do not have to follow along with me um, unless you enjoy that. I know some of you prefer, you want to have somebody to read to you, and I like to try to read to the classes as often as I can, just it doesn't always <laughs> happen within our time frame. Now you have the choice. So uh, chapter 13 starts on page 104. So if you would turn to that page, and like I said, I'll put it up on the screen for you today. Plus that shrinks me down. You don't see me as, <laughs> as much. Uh, so we see this chapter is called Outings Explorations. Once we settled into block 28, that ache I'd felt since we 
since soon after we arrived in Manzanar subsided. It didn't entirely disappear, but it gradually submerged as semblances of order returned and our pattern of life assumed its new design. So kind of similar to maybe at home, you know, when it, we first started staying home for this beginning of our, our quarantine, you probably didn't know what to do with yourself at all. And now as we start to get into it, we understand what it is that we need to do. Hopefully you've built a schedule for yourself and you're able to follow it along and you feel a little bit more normal than those first few weeks where nobody knew what was going on at all. For one thing, Keel and I and all the other children finally had a school. During the first year, teachers had been volunteers. Equipment had been makeshift. Classes were scattered all over camp, in mess halls, recreation rooms, wherever we could be squeezed in. Now, a teaching staff had been hired. Two blocks were turned into Manzanar High, and a third block of 15 barracks was set up to house the elementary grades. We had blackboards, new desks, reference books, lab supplies, that second stable school year was one of the things our world, the, remember that um, yearbook from before, commemorated when it came out in June of 1944. My days spent in classrooms were largely a blur now as one merges into another. What I see clearly is the face of my fourth grade teacher, a pleasant face, but completely invulnerable. It seemed to me at the time with sharp, commanding eyes. She came from Kentucky. That's quite a ways away. Um, that's, uh, you know, remember they're in California. She wore wedgies, loose slacks, and sweaters that were too short in the sleeves. So notice that a positive there when we see the, the, in, um, the commas, when they say she wore wedgies, that's, that's not the wedgies we're thinking of. Like you might give somebody a wedgie. You know, it's a totally different. The, the, a positive that comes after it, loose slacks, that was the term for wedgies. I don't know why. Um, and sweaters that were too short in the sleeves, maybe like mine today. <laughs> um, a tall, heavy set spinster, about 40 years old. <laughs> She always wore a scarf on her head, tied beneath the chin, even during class, and she spoke with a slow, careful Appalachian accent. So I'm going to stop for a second because they're calling her a heavyset spinster. So a spinster, I usually think of an old lady who has never been married. But then they mention that she's about 40 years old, and that's younger than me, but I am married, so I'm not considered to be a spinster. Um, but so we're thinking about her motivations. What would bring her all the way from Kentucky to California just to teach? Um, so for one thing, we see there that you know she was never married. It could be one helpful motivation, but keep keep looking here. So she always wore a scarf on her head tied beneath her chin, even during class. And she spoke with a slow, careful Appalachian accent from the mountain range that she probably comes from. She was probably the best teacher I've ever had. Strict, fair-minded, dedicated to her job. Take a look at those adjectives right there. Which of those would help her motivate her to want to come um, to teach them? Because of her, when we finally returned to the outside world, I was, academically at least, more than prepared to keep up with my peers. I see her face, but what I hear still ringing in my mind's ear is the glee club I belong to, made up of girls from the fourth, fifth, and sixth grades. We rehearsed every day during the last period. In concert, we wore white cotton blouses and dark skirts. 40 voices strong, we would line up at assemblies or at talent shows at the fire break and sing out in unison all the favorites school kids used to learn. Beautiful Dreamer, Down by the Old Mill Stream, Shine on Harvest Moon, Battle Hymn of the Republic. Outside of school, we had a recreation program with leaders hired by the War Relocation Authority. During the week, they organized games and crafts, uh, craft activities. On weekends, we often took hikes beyond the fence. A series of picnic groups and camping sites had been built by internees, clearings with tables, benches, and toilets. The first was about a half mile out, the farthest several miles into the Sierras. 
As restrictions gradually loosened, you could measure your liberty by how far they let you go. To Camp 3 with a Caucasian. To Camp 3 alone. To Camp 4 with a Caucasian. To Camp 4 alone. So notice that difference when they're saying with a Caucasian, you know, that would be uh, a white person accompanying them to that particular place. Then they gain their trust, their, the, the restrictions lessen up, they get to go by themselves, etc. As fourth and fifth graders, we usually hiked out to Camp One on the edge of Bears Creek, where we would wade, collect rocks, and sit on the bank eating lunches. The mess hall crew packed for us. I would always take along a quart jar and a white handkerchief and sit for an hour next to the stream, watching it strain through the cloth, trickling under the glass. Water there was the clearest I've ever seen, running right down off the snow. One of our leaders on those excursions was a pretty young woman named Lois, about 25 at the time, who wore long braids, full skirts, and peasant blouses. She was a Quaker, like so many of the Caucasians who came in to teach and do volunteer work. So a Quaker is a type of religion. She also had a crush on a tall, very handsome and popular Nisi boy who sometimes sang and danced in the talent shows. His name was Iso. In order to find a little free time together, Lois and Iso arranged an overnight camping trip for all the girls in our class. We took jars for water, potatoes to roast, and army blankets and hiked up Bears Creek one Friday afternoon to a nice little knoll at the base of the mountains. All the girls were tittering and giggling at the way Iso and Lois held hands and looked at each other. They built us a drift, big driftwood fire that night and told us ghost stories until they figured we had all dozed off. Then they disappeared for a while into the sagebrush. I was still awake and heard their careful footsteps snapping twigs. I thought how hard it would be to walk around out there without a flashlight. It was years later that I remembered and understood what that outing must have been for them. At the time, I had my own escape to keep me occupied. In truth, I barely noticed their departure. This was the first overnight camping trip I'd ever made. For me, it was enough to be outside the barracks for a night, outside the square mile of wire next to a crackling blaze and looking at stars so thick and so close to the ground, I could have reached up and scooped out an armful. If I had been told the next morning that I could stay outside the fence as long as I wanted, that I was free to go, it would have sent me sprinting for the compound. Lovely as they were to look at, the Sierras were frightening to think about. An icy barricade. If you took off in the opposite direction and made it past the Inos, you'd hit Death Valley. While to the south, there loomed a strange, a range of brown sculpted hills everyone said were full of rattlesnakes. Camp One was about as far as I cared to venture. What's more, Block 28 was where I lived now. One night was plenty, one night every once in a while to explore whatever was out there. You might call that the image for a whole series of little explorations. I began to make during the next year, looking for someplace outside, early gropings for that special thing I could be or do for myself. In addition to the regular school sessions and the recreation program, classes of every kind were being offered all over camp. Singing, acting, trumpet playing, tap dancing, plus traditional Japanese arts like needlework, judo, and kendo. The first class I attended was in baton twirling, taught by a chubby girl about 14 named Nancy. In the beginning, I used a sawed off broomstick with an old tennis ball stuck on one end. When it looked like I was going to keep at this, Mama ordered me one like Nancy's from Sears Ro Roebuck catalog. Nancy was a very good twirler and taught us younger kids all her tricks. For months, I practiced joined the baton club at school, and even entered contests. Since then, I have often wondered what drew me to it at that age. I wonder, because of all the activities I tried out in camp, this was the one I stayed with. In fact, returned to almost obsessively when I entered high school in Southern California a few years later. By the time I was desperate, or by that time, I was desperate to be accepted and baton twirling was one trick I could perform 
that was thoroughly, unmistakably American. Putting on the boots and a, a dress crisscrossed with braids, spinning the silver stick and tossing it high to the tune of a John Philip Sousa march. So think about it. She came right out and told you what it is that attracts her to the baton twirling. And she took her a little while of reflection later on to think of what that is. But the biggest thing is that it is so, let me see it right in here, unmistakably American. So something that will help her to be accepted, especially when she goes out of the, the compound. Even at 10, before I really knew what waited outside, the Japanese in me could not compete with that. It tried in camp and many times later in one form or another. My visit to the old geisha who lived across the fire break was a typical example of how those attempts turned out. She was offering lessons in the traditional dancing called odori. A lot of young girls studied this in order to take part in the big Oban festival held every August, a festival honoring dead ancestors, asking them to bring good crops in the fall. She was about 70, a tiny aristocratic looking woman. She took students in her barracks cubicle, which was fitted out like a little Buddhist shrine with tatami mats on the floor. She would kneel in her kimono and speak very softly in Japanese, while her young assistant would gracefully swing closed knees or bend her swan-like neck to the old geisha's instructions. I sat across the room from her for an hour trying to follow what was going on. It was all a mystery. I had never learned the language, and this woman was so old. Even her dialect was foreign to me. She seemed for an occult figure, more spirit than human. When she bowed to me from her knees at the end of the hour, I rushed out of there, back to more familiar surroundings. Something about her fascinated me though. For a while, I tried to keep in contact with her lore via the reports of two girls from my class, Rico and Mitsu. Mitsi, I don't know how to say her name, <laughs> who had stayed on as students. Because they came from wealthy families and spoke and understood both English and Japanese, they had high opinions of themselves. Whenever I pressed them for details of what they'd learned, they would tease me. A good dancer must have good skin, Rico would say. In order to have good skin, you must rub rose brilliantine hair tonic on your face and rub cold cream in your hair. I went home and did this secretly when no one else was around and waited for my skin to become the skin of an adori dancer. You have to think about your clothing, Mitsu would tell me. A good dancer is recognized by her clothing. You should wear your stockings inside out and never, never wear any underpants. I did this too on the sly until mama asked me why my socks were always inside out and why I was wearing nothing underneath my dress. She was not amused when I explained it to her. She told me to stay away from those girls. They were just being mean. And if I wanted lessons from the old geisha woman, mama herself would take me over there and arrange it. I shook my head and told her no. I didn't want to do that right now. I had another kind of dancing in mind. This time it was ballet. I had never seen ballet. I'd only heard of it, but it sounded like something I would want to do. In Ocean Park, I had taken tap dancing lessons. My older brothers would coax me to perform for visitors, and it gained me a lot of attention. In camp, I had already danced in a couple of talent shows. When the word came around that a woman was offering ballet lessons, I showed up with three other young girls. It was a dusty day anyhow, and there wasn't much you could do outside. I just realized I never turned the page for you last time. I'm sorry about that. So we're all the way at the bottom of 111 about to turn the page again. The classroom was an abandoned barracks. No one had lived there for months. Light showed through the warped planking. It was almost like going back two years to the day we first arrived, except that a piano sat on the bare splintered boards and here was a 30-ish Japanese woman. with her hair pulled back in a 
a chignon, which is basically a bun, wearing a pink tutu, a pair of pink toe dancing shoes, and no tights. At the piano sat a young girl with glasses on, studying some sheet music in the not quite adequate light from a single overhead bulb. When we were all in the room and seated on the floor, she began to play and the dancer began to dance as if she were the one trying out, not us. She twirled and leaped from wall to wall, flinging her arms. She had been a good dancer once, but now she was overweight and sad to watch, even in the eyes of a 10 year old who had never seen this kind of dancing. I was intrigued by her strange flat toed shoes badly frayed, worn down by the boards. I stared too at her legs. I could not stop watching them while she spun, sidestepping knot holes. They were thick, white, blue veined, tapering sharply from the quivering thighs, the kind of legs my older sister would have called daiganashi. Daikan means horseradish, ashi is leg. She began to show us a few steps and tricks, beginning with the splits. She hoisted herself and reversed her torso and came down again with her legs spread. I winced. Sure, the planks would tear her skin. Then she got the four of us up to try first position, which I did mainly out of courtesy, in order not to hurt the feelings of this heavy woman with her daikin ashy and her shredded shoes. After showing us the first three ballet positions, she sat down to rest. She took her shoes off. Her toes were showing blood. I noticed then the lines in her face, the traces of gray in her black hair. I felt sorry for her. I decided to go ahead and sign up for her course. But once I left that room, back out into the dusty, wind-flurried afternoon, I never did return. Ballet seemed then some terrible misuse of the body, and she was so anxious to please us. Her very need to hold on to whatever she had been scared me away. So that's where I'm going to pause to talk about the old ballet dancer. So first of all, um, I will talk a little bit about ballet. And um, many of you know that I was a dancer, and I did do ballet, and I did do point. I no longer teach that. I haven't taught dance since I was 16 years old, um, other than the little bit of choreography that um, I did at the school. So when they say that she takes her shoes off and that you, they saw blood, that is a real thing for ballet dancers. Um, there's, there is a very special shoe that they wear. There is... Um, things that they put inside the shoe to help protect their foot. But the more that they rehearse, they do, they get blisters on their feet and sometimes those blisters break and their feet bleed. Um, I, to me, that didn't really seem that bad because I was also a gymnast and the same sort of thing happened on our hands when we worked on the bars. It was something that, a sacrifice that you made. I'm sure whatever sport that you have, there's, there's some kind of, uh, you know, horror story you could share with us that you're like, oh my goodness, you do that. But the thing is here, she's not a young dancer anymore. She has lost her dancer's body. There is no way you're going to see me put on point shoes and even fit my feet anymore that I would hop up and dance around and show you what I can do because I can't do it anymore. Well, apparently this lady really can't do it either. I could certainly teach you first position and fifth position and all of those. Those aren't that hard. Um, but yeah, she's, she's trying to hold on to something um, that it, she doesn't have anymore. So that la last part there, um, what is it that scared her away? It's that she's really trying to hold on to her past. I, I like to always make the comparison in class to um, the uncle in Napoleon Dynamite. Can you relate to that? How he is constantly talking about the high school football games and he cannot let it go when you can probably tell that uncle is like 30 years old and you're like, why are you still talking about your football games from 20 years ago? The same sort of thing. You're like, okay, you need to move on. You need to move on. So what is the advice that we as modern people can, can get, not advice, but what is it that we can learn from this woman? Do we want to hold on to the things of our past or do we need to move on? All right, and I'm going to move on with our reading. I think, yeah, we're almost at the end of the chapter here. So I will put it back up for you again. And we are on page 113 at the break. 
Among my explorations during these months, there was one more final venture into Catholicism, so being Catholic. The Marion Old Chapel was just up the street now and easy to get to. I resumed my catechism. Once again, I was listening with rapt terror to the lives of the saints and the martyrs, although that wasn't really what attracted me to this. I had found another kind of inspiration, had seen another way the church might make me into something quite extraordinary. I had watched a girl my own age shining at the center of one of their elaborate ceremonies. It appealed to me tremendously. She happened to be an orphan, and I figured that if this was this much could befall an orphan, imagine how impressive I would look in such a role. I had long observed her from a distance, a slim and lovely girl, and always aloof because of the way other kids treated orphans there. As if a lack of parents puts you somehow beneath everyone else. I confess I felt that way myself. Orphans were in a class apart. In Block 28, we saw them often, Children's Village, where Sister Suzanne and Sister Bernadette put in a good deal of time, was as near to us as their chapel, two blocks away in the opposite direction. Each day, about a dozen of them, including this girl, would come trooping past our barracks on the way to a catechism lesson. On days I had intended to go, I would wait there, I would wait till they were half a block ahead, so I wouldn't be seen arriving in their midst. This girl had already been baptized. What I witnessed was her confirmation. She was dressed like a bride in a white gown, white lace hood and sheer veil walking toward the altar down the aisle of that converted barracks. Watching her from the pew, I was pierced with envy for the position she had gained. At the same time, I was filled with awe and with a startled wonder at the notion that this girl, this orphan, could become such a queen. A few days later, I let it be known that I was going to be baptized in, into the church and confirmed as soon as the nuns thought I was ready. I announced this to the sisters and they rejoiced. I announced it at home and Papa exploded. No, he roared, absolutely not. I just stood there, stunned too scared to speak. You're too young. I started to cry. How are you going to get married? He shouted. If you get baptized a Catholic, you have to marry a Catholic. No Japanese boys are in the Catholic church. You get baptized now, how are you going to find a good Japanese boy to marry? I ran to mama, but she knew better than to argue with him about this. I ran to the chapel and told Sister Bernadette and she came hurrying to the barracks. She and Papa had become pretty good friends over the months. Once every week or so she would visit, and while he sipped his apricot brandy, they would talk about religion. But this time, when she came to the door and called, Wakasuki-san, he met her there shouting, no, no baptism. She raised her eyebrows, trying to stare him down. He rose to his full height, as if she, about the size of Mama, were the general of some invading army, and said, too young, old enough to know God. Who knows anything of God at 10? This made her angry. At any other time, they would have, been, have taken an hour hearing each other out. But now when she opened her mouth to reply, his upheld flat palm stopped her. He was not going to argue. He wouldn't even let her pass the door. In exasperation, she glared at him, then turned and walked away. I ran to my bunk, devastated, and wept, hating him. I was too ashamed to go back to catechism after that. I just hated Papa for weeks and dreamed of the white-gowned princess I might have become. Late afternoons, practicing my baton in the fire break, angrily I would throw him into the air and watch him twirl and catch him and throw him high again and again and again. So what is Papa's reasons for not letting her be baptized into the church? Does it have to fully do with religion? Mm, a little bit. The little bit is that he wants her to marry a Japanese boy and there's no Japanese boys in the Catholic church. And if she's a Catholic, she needs to be a, marry a Catholic. That's 
their rules at the time. Um, his other main reason though, is that she is too young. Does she understand what she's doing by choosing to be baptized into the church? And think about the way she acts at 10 years old. Is she, is she thinking about God? Is that why she wants to join the Catholic Church? Is she found God and she wants to become baptized? No, she wants to be a princess. She wants to wear the white dress and have everybody recognize her. Those are not the right reasons to be baptized and join the church. So is Papa right? Probably, in this case, he probably is right. All right, so I may have answered all those questions for you, but hopefully it helped you out. Hopefully you get those written down. And I guess I will see you tomorrow for the next chapter. Have a great day.